Hello, my AP Calc BC friends. We're going to take a look at video number two from our Lagrange error bound. I know that this is probably an overwhelming topic for you. Hang in there. The more you watch examples, the more you work through examples and check answers, you're going to feel better about it. I know it's weird. Hang in there. So thinking. Here is our problem. We're asked to find the third degree polynomial approximation for e to the x at x equal 1 centered at 0. And we're going to use Taylor's inequality to find the range of possible values for e to the x at x equal 1. Now, this is an unusual problem in that we're essentially asking you to figure out what is e to the first power. And I think you might have a little bit of knowledge about that, the 2.71, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to rely on any kind of memorization of that, and we're going to work through the process and see what we've got. Now, unlike the previous problem, example one that we were doing, we do not have that Taylor polynomial given to us explicitly. So we're going to have to build this one um, unless you have it memorized. But I'm going to be honest, it's a little early. I would be impressed. I start to push my students to memorize things by the time we get to topic 10.14 if they haven't already. So let's go ahead and work through this one. So we start with our original function which is e to the x and we have to take a bunch of derivatives, three derivatives in fact, so that we can get down to our third degree polynomial. Well, I hate to break the news to you but taking these derivatives is going to be mighty boring because this is what they are. There's not a lot of change in them. Boom. Now we're going to evaluate each of these at zero because after all, we're looking for a Maclaurin polynomial to be precise. And by the time you find f of zero and f prime of zero and f double prime and f triple prime of zero, you just get one each time. Yeah, not a whole lot going on there. So by the time we put together our polynomial, p sub 3 of x, we learn that it's just simply 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial times x minus 0 to the first plus 1 over 2 factorial times x minus 0 to the second plus 1 over 3 factorial, which I'm going to go ahead and simplify to 6, if it's OK with you, times x to the third. And now, what we're trying to do in this problem is approximate e of 1, which we know is possible by using our polynomial approximation. And in this case, we get 1 plus 1 plus 1 half times 1 squared, which is 1 half, plus 1 sixth times 1 cubed, which is 1 sixth. And if I work that out, getting a common denominator, we end up with 16 sixths. I'll leave it to you to verify. And that reduces to 8 thirds, which is what? 2 point, ooh, interesting, 2.67. Two wow, that's kind of close, right? All right, but our job now is to use Taylor's inequality to find the range of possible values. So what that means next is we're going to go into our full-blown Taylor's inequality, which says that the remainder sub 3, in other words, the remainder using the third term uh, polynomial, the third degree polynomial, and we're going to go ahead and evaluate it at 1 that is our x, that we know is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of the max. And again, if you're kind of lost, we're just following along with this expression up here. The max of the nth plus 1 derivative, that would be the fourth derivative, the fourth derivative of our function evaluated at some z, divided by 4 factorial, right, times our x minus c, which is 1 minus 0, to the nth plus 1, or fourth power in this case. Now, where all of our trouble is, it's right here. If you remember, that's the part about the Lagrange error bound that bothers students the most. And my advice is to not let it bother you. 
don't let it bother you because there's sometimes the fact that you just can't do anything about it. So what we're looking for is take the fourth derivative of f, which, oh gosh, that's easy. That's just e to the x. And I want to evaluate that at some z. Okay, z, you say. Well, what's the deal with z? Well, z is a number between c and, and uh, x, which in this case is 0 and 1. So you would have to essentially evaluate e to the 0 power or somewhere in between up to e to the first power. Well, again, I might say, well, that's just silly because I would need a calculator to figure out what that is. And the whole point of this problem is to work through these potentially without the use of a calculator. So what you're going to have to do is find the safest maximum value you can of that function. And the one place that we can do that is probably a little bit past 1, something beyond 2.7. And I'm going to use 3. I know, that sounds blasphemous. So I'm going to have 3 over 4 factorial times 1 to the 4th, which is 1. Just like we did in the previous problem, we had a sine of x. We had to say that the max value of that occurs at 1. And I know that that's working outside of that interval. Sometimes we have to. And that's why I say z will typically lie between c and x because sometimes we don't allow it to so that we can push on with the problem without the use of a calculator but i know i'm safe because i just said that my remainder is going to be less than and so if i took a a conservative approach on the maximum value of that and used three i'm going to be okay i know what you're sitting there thinking okay well if this thing is on a test how, how do i know what to use it's not going to happen Problems on tests and exams are going to be a little bit more specific in terms of what you're going to use for the max, and I promise you're going to see some examples very specific to that um, in some of the work that we do in class. So if we continue to work on this, uh, 3 over 24, I believe that's 1 eighth, and so that would be the maximum bound of our error. Now, it, we're asked here to find a possible range of values, a possible range of values. Well, what does that entail? Well, if you remember, we have an inequality that we can set up that's going to help us figure out what to do um, about this. And I'm going to revisit that inequality because it looked a little something like this. It says that our function value at x minus our polynomial approximation, absolute value, that would be the difference, that would be our error, is always going to be less than or equal to this remainder value that we just computed, this error value. And we'll put that in absolute values too to make sure that we don't uh, get confused about any negativeness. Now, specific to this problem, x, of course, is 1. Our function is e to the x. So we would have the absolute value of e, I'll put to the first for emphasis, minus our approximation, which was done up here, the p sub 3, n was 3. Again, um, our x was going to be a 1. And we had 8 thirds there. And that would be less than or equal to our 1 8 that we have for our r sub 3 expression. And all you have to do is solve this compound inequality by saying opposite of 1 8 is less than or equal to e minus 8 thirds is less than or equal to positive 1 8. And then if we add 8 thirds to all three of the sides, and I know it's a little bit rough going here, but I will work this through. I think we are going to get... Um, Let's see, just to double check, the common denominator is clearly 24. When I add 8 thirds to negative 1 eighth, so this would be negative 3 plus, uh, let's see, what will we get here? Negative 3 plus, well, you know what, let's just figure this out. We're going to add 8 thirds. I just don't want to mess this up. So if we multiply this by an 8, we get 64. If we multiply this by a 3, we get a 3. Uh, so I'm going to end up with 64 minus 3, 61 
24ths. Okay, just wanted to make sure there. And if I do the same thing over here, this ought to be a little bit easier because I'm going to have a positive uh, 3 24ths and, a, uh, and another 64 24ths. So that would be a 67 24ths. Boy, it's the little algebra arithmetic here that seemed to get me the most. Now, if I if I were to use a calculator on this just to convert these to decimals to give you an idea, it's not necessary for the problem, but I do want you to kind of see how this fits into the grand scheme of things here. And this would be that particular range that I would allow E to fall in. And if you know a little bit about E, 2.718, we certainly are in that range by using just a third degree uh, Maclaurin uh, polynomial in order to compute this. And again, the actual value of E is, uh, I believe, 2.71828 and some change after that. So there you go. Another example of using Taylor's inequality, the Lagrange error bound, kind of one in the same, to work through some error analysis. Hope this helps. If you like, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We're not done yet. We're going to keep talking about Taylor's inequality and the Lagrange error bound. We have one more example. And then, of course, we have a whole slew of wonderful problems to do in class to help you get better. We'll see you next time.